welcome to the Kuno podcast, everybody. As you can tell, we're still on YouTube, as well as all major platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, everything like this. And today we've got the amazing Sakoni with us. How are you doing? I, I'm doing wonderful, and you? I'm brilliant, thank you. I'm so excited for this interview because you talk about leadership fundamentals on your uh, Facebook and you've got your Next Level Leadership Summit that we can see behind you. And you've got two books, well, one book out and one book coming. Would you mind giving us a brief overview of how you got where you got to and, and why you do what you do? Well, I'm going to start with my first company. I was an entrepreneur and I had a company called 3D Solution Providers. I did 3D animation and illustration and we provided the service for small business. And our slogan was helping small business look big. So basically what we did is we created 3D animation, like explain the videos for new condos, addition to hospitals, inventions. I mean, basically anything that dealt with, with 3D that could be shown on a screen. Well, uh, in 2012, I was at a conference in Dallas, Texas, and I get this phone call, and it was from the conference organizers, and they said, Mr. Prince, your company has been selected to be a part of our Quick Pitch Business Olympics. We'll see you tomorrow morning in the Crystal Ballroom at 9 o'clock. I was like, okay, thank you, and I hung the phone up, and I was like, what is the Quick Pitch Business Olympics? I'm trying to figure out what, what have I just gotten myself into? I look at the brochure and the brochure says that I have three minutes to pitch my business to the listening audience and the select panel of judges. And so I immediately started my elevator speech. I immediately started going over and over in my head, my elevator speech. I, I actually started reciting out loud so I could hear it. And I know that my oldest son, because he was with me on the trip, I know he thought I had lost my mind because I was literally in the bathroom in the tub saying my speech over and over again because I wanted to sound natural and smooth. Well, the next morning I get up and we get to the ballroom early so I can go and see the layout. I notice in the back of the ballroom, there's a guy that's running the AV system because they have the shoe screen and this projector. And there's a guy in the back that's running all that. I thought to myself, I said, I wonder. So I go over and I talk to him and say, hey, look, can you play an, an MPEG file? He said, sure. So I had the file on my phone. He copied it on, on his system, pulled it up, make sure that it played and the sound was working. I said, okay. I said, once I get up, I'm going to start talking for about a minute and a half because I only had three minutes. Talk about a minute and a half and explain my business and everything. And then I want you to start showing the video. Long story short, I wound up getting up on stage and giving my presentation. And as I started talking, I had an epiphany. And my epiphany was that the words that I was using could be used for selling more than a product or service, but they could use to be uplift and changing people's lives. I didn't win that contest, but that contest really launched my speaking career. It put me on a path to understanding that, hey, I need to be motivating folks. I need to be spending my time helping them to see the best in, them, in their selves. I need to spend my time helping people to understand what they have and what they bring to the table. And so going back to my first book, my first book was entitled, Are You Climbing the Wrong Mountain? It's about finding your true purpose. And like I've told people time and time again, there are three things you can learn by being on the wrong mountain. The first thing is you can learn, okay, look, this is not it. I can scratch this off my list. This is not where I'm supposed to be. The second thing is that even being on the wrong mountain, you can see the right one. And that's what happened to me. While I was on stage sharing my story, talking about my business, trying to sell my services, I realized this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be motivating and encouraging people. So I saw the right mountain. So the second thing is, even being on the wrong mountain, you can see the right one. I saw where I was supposed to be. But then the whole story comes in, okay, I spent all this time, energy, and effort climbing this mountain, building this business, trying to get this off the ground, and now I realize I'm supposed to be over there. A lot of people will get depressed. But one thing I've learned is that even climbing the wrong mountain, and this is the third point, is that you've, 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 you've acquired mountain climbing skills. So once I've identified the right mountain, that means that I can then go to that, that mountain and I can get up at a whole lot faster because I know how to climb. And see, a lot of people, they never even start climbing. They stay in the valley. They stay at the foot of the mountain. Whether it's the right or the wrong one, they're not going anywhere. I would rather be climbing the wrong mountain, getting skills that I need, so when I find the right one, it's not going to take me that long to get up it. But a lot of people, they don't want to do that. They are afraid of what people might say. But my thing is this. Somebody is waiting for you to show up. And if you never show up, 
they won't have what you have to offer. I believe everybody has been given a gift and your gift is not for you, but it's for the world. So we have to get beyond ourselves and show up and share that gift with everybody. So that was my first book, Are You Climbing the Wrong Mountain? Which I then turned into a annual summit entitled, Are You Climbing the Wrong Mountain Summit? And I've had the summit for four years, but then last year, I decided to change the name because one thing I've learned, personal development is at the core of everything I do. But I know that once you learn how to lead yourself, the next thing is to lead others. The next logical step is to help lead others. Once you learn how to lead yourself, now, that doesn't mean that I've mastered every aspect of that. But what it does mean is that I've learned some skill, even leading myself that I can share with other people to help them do the same. So I changed the name of my summit from Are You Climbing the Wrong Mountain to Next Level Leadership Summit. And that's what I had this year. I had it online and it was an incredible event. I was, I was, I was surprised at the response because of course, you know, with COVID-19, you know, they've been limited, if, if any, in-person gatherings. But in fact, we were still able to create the same environment, the same experience, the same eye-opening experience online. And with that, I am truly grateful. And so from that particular summit, from the change in my, my focus from personal development to leadership, I've also started, and I'm actually almost completed, my latest book, which is entitled Leadership That Lasts, Passing on 10 Solid Principles to Leave an Enduring Legacy. And this is something I believe every leader needs to have, because one thing I've learned is that we don't stay here forever. A lot of us, we, our dreams don't have an expiration date but we do. Our dreams don't have an expiration date, but we do. And if we don't understand that we have an opportunity, we are in a relay race and we can pass on information to the next generation so that they can succeed even further than we did, then we will miss a tremendous opportunity to sow into our future and to our children. And so that's one of the reasons why I, I'm finishing up my latest book, Leadership That Lasts. And I am so excited and I tell people, one of the reasons why I truly appreciate this particular book, not just because I wrote it, but the information that's in it, I believe will help change somebody's life. I, I believe it will help them be a better leader and be an example for the next generation. We need leadership that has, that has integrity. And I, and I even talk about it. in the book, integrity is nothing more than your intents, your words, and your actions Lining up. I'm going to say that again for those that are making notes. Integrity is nothing more than what you mean to do, what you say you're going to do, and what you do, all of those lining up. And so having integrity is so important. And we need leaders that understand that. But I even deal with a whole lot of other different things about setting examples. And I mean, truly, I can't tell it all here, but it's in the book. And it's definitely worth the price of admission. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss that. So that's a little bit about myself. I've been speaking now for the past five years. I've speak, spoken internationally. I have an Amazon bestseller book, which are oh, you climbing the wrong mountain? And I'm believing that my latest book, Leadership That Lasts, is going to be in that same category. So on the topic of leadership, do you think that there is um, a holistic view of leadership where there is a certain type of leader or do you think there's many types and um, how do you go about kind of creating the mindset to be a leader and, and generate the skills to be able to be the best leader you can be? Well, I honestly believe that people have to have a desire to lead. I remember hearing Dr. Miles Monroe say that leaders are angry. And I was like, wait a minute, what do you mean leaders are angry? He said, leaders are angry because they want to see change. They see something that's not right in their estimation, and they want to change that leadership, but they have to have, have a certain amount of indignation to like, I'm not going to stand for this. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to change it. And so wanting to change, it, and it, it may be on a small level, in your neighborhood, in your community, you know, seeing something that's not right, seeing something that needs addressing. But I believe that there are leaders everywhere and all of us can be leaders in our own right. We may not have to lead at a certain level. 
He may not even have to have an official title. And a lot of people fail to understand that it's not the title that makes you a leadership. It's not the title that makes you a leader. It's what you do. So many people say, well, I'm not going to take those duties and those responsibilities. That's the duties and responsibilities of a manager or of a supervisor or of a CEO. Well, okay, why would somebody give you the job if you can't do it? So even before you get the title, are you doing the job? Are you putting in the work? And so as far as the different types of leadership, people, people that want to enact change and see change in their community, in their organization, in their relationships, they have to take the lead. They can't just wait for somebody to give them the green light. I mean, you need to get upset. You need to get mad enough about the situation where I'm going to do something about this. I'm not just going to sit idly by and let this happen. I'm going to make something happen. And that's what I believe that, that every leader does. They, they take on that role of how do we make this better? Now, there are some leaders who, for lack of a better term, they are insecure and they don't want to, to share that responsibility. But there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And in order for an organization, in order for a business, in order for even a relationship to go far, you have to go together. Anybody can go by themselves. But if you don't have the proper structure, the proper team, the proper mindset, you'll stay where you are. You know, when I was in college, I used to uh, have to move about every six months to a year in fact, because of the leasing fact that we had. And when I first got, got to college, I didn't have a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I literally could pack things up. I, I would put a sheet in the middle of the room, put everything in and tie it up and put it in the trunk. This is the kitchen, this is the bedroom. This is the, I mean, I, I had just, just that much. It was just that, it wasn't that much stuff. But towards the end of school, after I had accumulated some stuff, when I got ten, when I got ready to move, hey man, from what you doing Friday? I need you, I need you to help me move. Because I couldn't do it by myself because I had too much stuff. The reason I share that story is because a lot of people, your goal has to be so big that you can't do it by yourself. You have to get some help. You have to get somebody to come alongside and help you. And so as, as a leader, recognize that in order for you to accomplish anything worthwhile, anything that's big and lasting. You're going to need to get some help. Do you think that there are then um, many people that say they want to be leaders? Because I completely um, agree with the fact that I think if you want to be a leader, it's, it's because you've got passion and, and you want to fix something or you want to go somewhere because um, you've got that vision and you can see how you can you know interact with people to get there. Um, and managers kind of just manage people on a level where it's like here's a task and I need to optimize you and, and that's completely different but a lot of people say oh I want to be a leader but then they never take really any steps forward towards being it what what do you think is the difference between do you think it's because they've not got the passion or the vision or is it something else why you think that they never take that step I honestly believe that vision is critical for a leader but again, they have to see a vision beyond themselves. They have to be able to communicate that vision to the people that they're leading. They have to share it with enthusiasm and with passion, and they have to do it in such a way to where they get as excited as the leader is about seeing it come to pass. And it can't be self-serving. It has to be something that's, that benefits the whole and not just the individual. And so being able to paint that vision of a new future, of a better company, of more profits, a more sustainability of being able to give back to the community, that has to be at the center of what they're doing. And so a leader that lacks that, they put themselves in a position to where they're not gonna have that many people following them because after a while, People are going to understand and realize this is about you. This is not about the organization. This is not about the company. This is not about our community. This is not about making it better. This is a this is to feed your ego. But if you really want to get people involved, if you really want to get people to follow you, 
you have to be able to paint a picture of a better future for everybody, everybody that's concerned, everybody involved. And so I know for a fact that leaders who do that, they see greater success, greater sustainability. They, they are able to build teams and they're able to build people and rally people around them. Because again, it's not about them as an individual, but it's about the team, it's about the company, it's about the organization, it's about the relationship and where they're going. Even in families, you know, the matriarch or the patriarch of the family, being able to share a vision as to what they want the family dynamic to look like and then work towards that end. Everybody has a part to play. And so it's not just leadership in a corporate environment or leadership in, a, in an organization. I mean, in fact, we're talking about leadership across the board with mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. I mean, just being able to step up and make the change. So I honestly believe that there are leaders out there that, that have yet to develop those skills, primarily because they've been shown bad examples. People that are self-serving, people that are selfish, and people that aren't looking for the common good. But when you see somebody who isn't selfish, somebody who is looking for the common good, those are the people that you gravitate towards. Because if you want the same change they want, you'll line up with them. So being a leader as well, you, you've got this vision and you're going for it and you've got your team and you've got certain people around you that don't want this vision to happen because they've got the motivations and, and other things going on or they're not really backing you or something like that. Yeah. So you, you can experience a problem where you need to persuade or convince these people, but also sometimes these people are going to actively try and stop you what you're doing or things like this. Um, how do you deal with that situation? Well, one of the first things that a leader needs to learn how to do, and this is a part of the fundamentals of leadership, is they have to be aware of, of, this, of their current situation, meaning that they have to be observant. You know, if you can't be so, so stuck with your head in the clouds that you really don't know what's going on. I mean, you, you have to be able to assess a situation. Even before anybody tells you what's going on, you need to be able to witness and look at it for yourself. And then even in that process, take some notes, whether they're mental notes or written notes. And I would suggest, because once you get to a certain age, you can make mental notes all day, but when you go back and try to find them, they may be scattered. So take those mental notes and write them down, put them on paper, and then organize them so you can have your own assessment. So when you then start talking to, to the involved parties, to the people around you, you can see if what you thought you saw is what they said or what they claim. Again, if you allow somebody to just come in and tell you what's going on, they, gonna, they are going to tell it from their point of view and their vantage point, and you may not get the whole picture. But if you do your assessment first, if you understand the people that you're working with and what's going on and, what, and the in fact dynamics with them, then you can evaluate what they're saying based upon your assessment of them. So once you've talked to them, find out exactly what their motivations are. And I was in college, I was the assistant warehouse manager of a retail store in the US. And one of the things I quickly learned was the ability to to read my, my employees, you know, to find out what, what their motivation was, what caused them to get up and come and put in, you know, 20 or 40 hours a week at this particular place. Now, an actual insecure leader will use that to manipulate people, but a secure leader, someone who knows who they are and their role, will use that to motivate them to accomplish their goals. And so understanding the people around you and what their motivations are. And that comes from talking to them. It comes from spending time with them. That comes from finding out what's near and dear to, to their heart. Because if you have someone that's envious or jealous of you, it's going to show. It's going to show up in their talk, in their actions. But again, you have, you have to be able to pay attention. You can't just be blind to what's going on. I think a lot of leaders fail when they turn a blind eye to a bad situation and it just gets worse. And hiding your head in the sand is not going to fix it. You have to observe it and then you have to address it. You have to be willing to actually deal with it. And so going back to your question about like, people around you trying to actually keep you from accomplishing your goals, 
my question to them, and I would start off individually, just kind of have a little meeting with them, find out what's going on. I mean, again, you have your own, like your own thought processes at, you know, behind their actions, but don't just go to them and tell them, or oh, you're doing this because of this. No, find out why are you doing this? Again, you, you have your notes. I think you're doing this because of this, but I want you to tell me. Tell me what, what is the motives behind your actions? And that will help you to understand where they are. And sometimes it's just a communication issue. Sometimes people take stuff the wrong way. People get stuff twisted and it affects them. And that's why a leader has, you have to have the ability to communicate. Because again, if you can't communicate, you can't go together. You can go by yourself, but that's only going fast. But if you want to go far, everybody has to communicate. Everybody has to be on the same page. And it has to be done in such a way to where everybody sees the benefit. So having people on your team that are working against you is detrimental to, it's detrimental to morale. It's detrimental to your leadership. It's detrimental to the organization or the company as a whole. So you have to be willing and able to address those. And then again, you know, like I say, you can go to them one on one, and then you can take somebody else with you as a mediator, if you will. But you 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 have to address it because if you don't address it, Doctor Phil said you can't fix what you won't face. And so if you're not willing to face it, you definitely can't fix it. So the number one question I suppose here is conflict and crisis because we have to as leaders face this. But I. I don't know what your strategies are for, for dealing with conflicts and crisis, but I find that um, the number one question from people is how do I deal with it? And there's so many different ways that you might want to try and deal with it, but it's picking the right way so that you're not causing even more conflict or something else happens that you didn't plan on. Um, and that is really difficult to understand the landscape around you to be able to do that. So what strategies do you have for that? Well, one of the first things I tell people especially when you're dealing with change or dealing with conflict in a situation. The first thing you have to do is get your emotions in check. I mean, get your emotions in check because most of the time when we respond out of our emotions, we are off. You may come in too hot, too heavy handed, overkill. If we come in emotionally, you tend to make mistakes. I tell people all the time, I say, Never let your emotions drive. They're not covered on your insurance. <laughs> your emotions are like your children. And at a certain age, they can't drive until they reach a certain age. So you can't let them drive because they're not going to be responsible for the damage. Your emotions are the same way. It's so true. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you, I'm telling you what I know. Your emotions are the same way, so you, you have to get your emotions in check. And a lot of people think, well, okay, I just need to suppress. No, you need to process your emotions. Don't suppress them, because when you suppress them, they're still there. You haven't dealt with them. You've just smothered them. And then they're going to fester, and it's going to come back even worse later. You need to process your emotions. So deal with your emotions. First, now, once you've done that, once you've dealt with your emotions, the next thing you need to do, you just need to get your mind right. Now, you're talking about dealing with conflict, okay? When you see a situation that gets you upset, it gets you hot, it gets you heated, instead of responding in that moment, again, get your emotions in check, but then get your mind right, okay? Figure out what happened and how can we avoid this in the future. I'm, I'm the father of five kids, which means I do a lot of time talking. <laughs> I tell people all the time, I said, if I spank my children every time they did something wrong, I would have to contract it out. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because there's no way I could do that. But so I spent a whole lot of time talking to my kids. And so oftentimes I'll say to them, okay, next time, we can't do anything about this now, but next time, let's avoid the situation. If you have your drink on the table right at the edge and you're talking, yes, you're going to knock it over. Next time, let's put it up in the center of the table. So that way, as you talk and move your hands, there's a less likelihood of you knocking it over. And so even as a leader, 
understanding these situations. Okay, look, this is what happened this time. Okay, we're here. All right, how can we avoid getting here again? What happened to get us here? And how can we avoid that in the future? And so that's what dealing with conflict is. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, people take stuff personally. Somebody may be going through something, dealing with something unrelated to the job, but it's affecting them. Understanding that the people that are working for you or the people that are part of your organization, they have things going on outside of that. It helps you as a leader to address them in a different way. And I mean, of course, you don't have to get all in a business and know everything that's going on. But if it's affecting that job, then it becomes a part of your business. So you need to find out, is everything okay? Are you fine? Is there anything you need help with? And I mean, of course, being open to actually hear them and see where they are. And is there anything that, that you can do as a leader to help them, even if it's pointing them to somebody else, even if it's getting them the resources they need or sharing with them some information that they didn't know about. But as a leader, you can do that because that helps keep down that conflict and it helps build more synergy. And even among people, don't, don't build an environment to where it's an unhealthy competition, to where people are looking to, you know, to bite and claw their way over somebody else. No, that should never be the case. If anything, it should be a team effort. I mean, anytime, any team wins a championship, everybody celebrates. The coaches, you know, the, the tower person, the person that's bringing them water, everybody celebrates. They weren't on the field, but they were part of the team. They did their part. So understanding that, okay, look, that's a part of leadership, building that environment to where everybody's looking out for each other. Everybody is, is, is looking to make the other person, person next to them better and not bitter. That's what a true leader does. So that's how you deal with conflict. You know, being able to get your emotions in check, get your mind right. But then after you've gotten your plan together, then you have to take action. And there's another thing I've learned too. So if somebody's writing down, first thing, get your emotions in check. Second thing is get your mind right. That means get your plan together. The third thing is actually execute the plan but then there's a fourth one. The fourth one is repeat. That's right, I say repeat because I don't care how good you are at dealing with a conflict one time, guess what? It's gonna happen, something's gonna happen again. Something's gonna come up again. So if you don't even have the mindset that you're gonna to have to repeat, you'll be like, oh, I thought we dealt with this last year. Okay, that was last year. Now we have a totally different dynamic. Things have changed since last year. And now you have to repeat the process. Get your emotions in check again. Get your mind right, take action, but then know that inevitably you're going to have to do it over again. And so that's what I honestly believe leaders need to, they need to prepare and prep themselves. There's a difference in responding and actually replying or reacting. There's a difference in responding and reacting. If you react to something, you didn't have any sort of notion that it was going to happen. But when you respond, you have a predetermined, okay, if this happens, I'm gonna do this. If this happens, I'm gonna do that. And so you actually have that vision of how do I deal with conflict? How do I address it? What steps do I take in order to actually mediate this? As opposed to just, we're not gonna have any conflict. Everything's gonna be great. Everything's gonna be wonderful. Everything's gonna be fine. And then it happens like, okay, now what do I do? No, you need a response, not to react. That is a really difficult skill to learn. And I'm not sure if it always comes with experience because I know that when I first started being a leader, I was really passionate, but that came with a real hot headedness. And actually it takes a bit of time to grow up and understand that you can, you know, and I think I learned it through doing a bit of philosophy and, and it's kind of like law where you argue a point and you start persuading and there's not really any emotion with it in, in that kind of thing. It's all kind of just figuring out how to win the argument. Yes. And I think from there, I learned a bit more how to deal better with conflicts and actually now conflict is not as much of a big deal for me as it was because I, I didn't know how to handle it when I was a young leader. So I, I think they, I don't know, do you think it comes with experience or do you think you need to learn it? Well, I think it does come with experience, but it can be taught. And it's one of the reasons, and this is a good segue into my next book, 
which is leadership that lasts because I'm really talking uh, talking to leaders about grooming and mentoring other leaders. Can you imagine if you would have had somebody to come to you when you first started leading and actually educate you and share their experiences and their war stories and their war wounds as to, as to how they did stuff right and how they did stuff wrong, that could have helped you avoid a lot of pitfalls. Mm -hmm. and that's what I think a lot of leaders lack is that foresight to understand, I need to share this information. I need to give it to somebody else. Instead of letting somebody else go through the same hard knocks that they went through, set them up for success. So if you would have had somebody in your life that would have been in a position to actually mentor you and actually help you to understand how to maneuver as a leader, I think that your outcome would have been totally different. And you would have got to where you needed to be faster than, like I said, going by yourself. If you had somebody that to help teach you and to help mentor you, help mold and shape you. And even somebody, I did a video one time. I said, we all need somebody to throw up on. You <laughs> <We> do. <laughs> we all need somebody to throw up on. And I even talked about how in that video, when our bodies, when we get sick, when we drink too much alcohol or get food poisoning, one well, of the first thing our body does is tries to get it out. And I mean, it just, it comes out. But see, until that happens, you know, the healing can't happen. And even from a leadership standpoint, us being able to have somebody that we can vent to, and that goes back to getting your, getting your emotions right. You don't necessarily want to throw up on your employees or throw up on the people you lead and or throw up on your group. You need somebody else that you can throw up on. <laughs> somebody else that can, that can actually help you wipe your mouth and get yourself back together so you can go back in and do what you need to do. And so just, just, just having those kind of people in your life. And most of the time, it has to be somebody that's, that's seasoned, somebody that has more experience, in fact, somebody that's actually done more than you've done in that area. They can be a good sounding board. They can be a good mentor and a good place for you to vent so that you can get the information you need and then put it into practice. And one thing I love that you said was that, that you had to learn stuff. And that's what a lot of people, even, even in leadership, every leader doesn't get it right. There's nobody perfect. We make mistakes just like everybody else. But being willing to own up to those mistakes, being willing to apologize, hey, look, I came off wrong. I was, I was too hot-headed. I was too, you know, just being able to, to address ourselves puts us in a better position to be the leader that our people need. To. And they respect us more. When we can say they went wrong, I mean, I, I, I've had to actually apologize to my children for stuff that I, I took wrong. I had the wrong impression or the wrong idea, but I wasn't too big, in fact, to say I was sorry. I wasn't too big to apologize. And, and that teaches them, it's okay if you mess up, but just own up. I tell them, I said, one of the first signs of maturity is being willing to take responsibility for your actions, be it good or bad. And even as a leader, when you accomplish and hit your goals, everybody celebrates. When things fall short, take their responsibility. It may not be your responsibility to make it happen, but it's your responsibility to make sure it gets done. So you're not necessarily to do the work, but to make sure that the work gets done. So even if somebody else didn't do it, did you follow through? Did you hold them accountable? Because that's, that falls on you. Instead of you pointing, well, you fan, you dropped the ball. No, I didn't follow. I didn't make sure that you had everything that you need. And then even if they had something that they needed to actually bring to you, that they weren't comfortable enough to come and talk to you, okay, but then I need to be more open. I need to be more approachable. And then even if it's one of those things where I, I need to check up on them, uh, on them a little more. I need to actually check in and see how things go. Don't wait till the last minute. That's one thing I hate. I hate last minute stuff. As soon as I find out something that's going to impact somebody else, I try to let everybody know right then. Because in order to make an informed decision, you need information. But if you wait till the last minute, just let the people can do it. Because time keeps marching on. So. 
Well, so Cody, we're coming up to the end of the interview and I could literally talk to you all day on this. Uh, but would you like to tell everybody where they can kind of find you on the internet and then we'll post it all below so that people can click straight through to you as well? Sure. Actually, if you go on all social media and search Sacconi Prince, C-I-C-O-N-E-P-R-I-N-C-E, -E, you can find me everywhere. But my website is SacconiPrince.com. That's C-I-C-O-N-E-P-R-I-N-C-E.com. And I mean, I can be found on LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I don't do Snapchat, <laughs> but, but, but all other brands of kind of social media, I'm on that, so. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much for guesting on the uh, YouTube podcast. Well, thank you for having me. And I want to say to your listeners that they have something special that, that the world is waiting on. And you are proof of that because you did not wait for somebody to give you the green light to do what you're doing. And I want to encourage them, they can do the same. Whatever it is that you have in your heart to do, don't wait, do it now, because somebody is waiting on what you have. I would completely agree with that. Well, thank you so much.